Thanks for coming back for Public Square, and we are joined by some of our community leaders. Rodney, you know, this issue of men of color has gotten a lot more attention recently with President Obama's initiative, My Brother's Keeper. So are things changing? They are um, being somewhat addressed, but I think our community doesn't really realize that uh, the severity of these years of uh, not being included and not being paid attention to. I, I think there needs to be a dramatic change and a rethink uh, paradigm shift in how we think of our men of color. Also, uh, we need to start talking with our youth at a much earlier age, I believe. Um, instead of waiting till high school or until somebody is, has a concern uh, after high school, we really need to start addressing and uh, talking with them in third and fourth grade uh, making sure those role models are available, making sure those mentors are available, and taking some of these young men out and letting them tell their stories. We need to really make sure that we're not uh, egotistically trying to press our values on, onto them. So do you guys feel like, are you heard when you talk, when you're telling your stories? Are you heard? Yeah, basically, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. And it feels but, good to be heard. But how often do you but get how, to tell your yeah. story? Well, not often because we have to do it ourselves. We have to get out and go around and eat. It's just like the people that's standing on the corner or needing food or anything. I started I start to recently start to see signs that say if you're hungry or you need shelter, call this number or mm -hmm. do this. So that's a way of telling them that if you're really in need for money or need for things like that. And I, I see a lot of young people then call this number, you know? Mm -hmm. Instead of waiting till people come by and feel sorry for you, we have to do it like, basically the way that they put the signs up, like, um, yeah, call this number or do this or be this way, then that's a, that's a legal way to me. I, I think there's a lot of services out there, but they're siloed. And we have to really yeah. actually stop being afraid to reach out and be humanistic in our, yeah. in our value system and really help each other. If I see somebody out on the street, don't uh, assume that that's a bad person. Assume that they've yeah. had, they've had a, some uh, trial and error in their life, but they need some help. And don't be afraid to, to let your guard down and go help someone. It's yeah, not easy. I, I agree. I agree yeah. with you on uh, services being siloed. But Native Americans in general only go to specific places for like First Nations in Albuquerque or uh, Albuquerque you know, Indian Center or specific places. But then the funding is just streamed from there to the reservations. So these urban Native American centers are uh, competing with uh, reservations for funding. So like Native Americans in general in this city of Albuquerque are getting more and more uh, competition from reservation community and services. Uh, and that's why you see a lot of homeless Native American men, particularly in Albuquerque. And so what I'm trying to do is trying to work with uh, all Native American um, coalitions, organizations in our to see if we can provide a, an even spread or even a collaborative uh, service model as opposed to a siloed model that you spoke of. But I think so, that's one of, the, yeah. one of the challenges I think having worked with so many community organizations and having started the Men of Color Initiative at the university is there is that, there is an overall competitive idea for a limited amount of resources in a place like Albuquerque hmm. where I think it's important. I know recently Public Square addressed the issue of school to prison pipeline and one of the things that I think is important for us to understand about that competition, that's a false sense of competition, right? When, there's, when we want money for things, we make that happen. Mm -hmm. So we know with young men of color, we spend $6,000 to send a young person through APS. How many of you went to Albuquerque Public Schools? I did. Yeah. $6,000 a year. We have an alternative justice program, the one that would place somebody at La Placita or another program, but it's an alternative to juvenile justice. That's about $30,000 a year in Bernalillo County. But if we want to put a young person behind bars in juvenile detention, that's $100,000 a year. So what would $100,000 a year do for a young person at La Placita? Mm. <laughs> I, I Ansel has some ideas. Or, 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 or um, I think it's like the New Mexico yeah. Asian Family Center. Now, that would probably fund your program for like years, right? Yeah, yeah. 
when we're talking about agencies or services, people of color are uh, always identified with food stamps and mm -hmm. being on um, state aid or something. So there's like also that stigma of people not wanting to go to these kind of agencies because of um, it's like a handout to them instead of saying it's a, it's a step up. It's a way of moving yeah. forward. So I think that's a big issue when it comes to well, and I, you, when you guys were talking about silos, I think it's so interesting. I didn't plan this, but three of you work. Um, in uh, program areas where you're dealing with gender-based violence right. yeah. against women, but you're running male engagement groups. So I think that's really interesting because that's often, we don't hear that crossover right. very much, but that's a way for you to get men to come together and talk about what we talked about, what does it mean to be a yeah. man in and society. Here's, and here's one of the challenges to those programs, by the way, is what Larry was just saying about people of color not wanting to access services that are typically aren't yeah. for us or our communities. Because talk about our schools being places where we don't see ourselves. A lot of these agencies are social workers or therapists <laughs> or, are all white women, right, typically. That the other thing is that we have to address the machismo in our communities where we don't want to get help because that means that you're weak. Gender-based violence, you know, has to have a lot of male engagement. Um, I'm working right now with a coalition to stop violence against Native women, and they developed a leadership model um, geared particularly with all youth age 12 to 18. Um, and they're looking at queer LGBT communities, also men, uh, young men, and young women, to participate in this. And they, they're starting early because they want to prevent violence not just in the city, but also in the res uh, tribal communities. But the male engagement is one of those things that we all have to participate in because that machismo effect that you, that you spoke of, it's, it's apparent. Well, that's what I was going to ask now because you, uh, you went out and recruited men for a group that was about gender-based violence. Right. So I'm trying to picture your sales pitch. So we have to be honest with men that men are the biggest perpetrators of violence against women and men have to be part of the solution. So for me, there was really no pitch. It was just kind of bringing men together to talk about the issues and a lot of times like what everyone has shared here is is what men really need is a space for them to tell their stories uh, to validate their experiences because they just that doesn't naturally always occur it doesn't always occur because a lot of times like i think a lot of around that topic right right yeah, definitely that topic. that's one of the topics that well, or, or, yeah. or think mm -hmm. about this how how do we see men socialize in our communities how mm -hmm. do we, in terms of communicating number one we don't see men of color talking about issues on tv not on right. P, not on pbs right and and then in our families, there could be spaces, but those sometimes actually reproduce the violence yep. rather than actually try to change that. You know, I think the other thing is there's so many people around this circle, you know, NAM included, I was talking to somebody earlier, right, how we are, we're thinking outside the box, and I think that's some of the things that viewers need to hear about is the ways that we're using dance, basketball, soccer, hip -hop. arts, hip-hop, poetry, poetry yeah. um, gardening, farming, like meet young men of color where they're at. Well, I know you, you work with young men in middle schools, like, uh, and you guys are now used to, you know, you're comfortable with each other and coming together in groups and talking, mm -hmm. but that's kind of hard for young men, right? Definitely, uh, but I do see that, it, that if the space is there, they do open up. Because you found that space in La Plazita. Yeah, right? I, I definitely. It's a trust yeah. issue. Every week we do come together as a crew and we do, we do, uh, we do circles and we, we um, We'll smudge ourselves off with sage. We bring our like our levels down. Just to kind of come together, and so we already have this like deal with with each other. Like we, whatever is said here stays here. We're not gonna bring it out at all. Like it's, we can't even bring it up with each other anymore. Like after this meeting's over, we, we won't like something that's been said. We won't. We'll ask permission first to like before we bring it up in a, a um just ain't that we talk about. So just having that said, everyone agrees to it. Everyone like you know gives their words. So then we all. In our meetings, we just all open up to each other, whatever's going on in our lives, whatever we went through. We all, we all can feel comfortable in a space that we can all just share together you know, as brothers. And That's mm -hmm. an important model. That's restorative justice. And when I think of the opportunities that are missed in our, as Rodney was saying, in our elementary and middle schools, that young men of color would have to be able to say, guess what? You can talk out what you're feeling. Especially the public school system in Albuquerque where we're teaching to the test, those options are not available I didn't test very good. School is, should be for us to learn from. And in learning, you have to make some mistakes. But we're not letting our students take any risks or make any mistakes. We're penalizing them and putting them in the school to prison pipeline uh, where they are set 
to go in one direction if they make a mistake. We have to do some restorative justice and, and make sure that they um, can learn from their mistakes mm -hmm. and understand their mistakes and pass it on to their peers and move forward instead of going into a penal system. Some of you come yeah, from yeah. traditional societies. We've lost sort of coming of age rituals uh -huh. because of modernization. Yeah. And I'm just wondering if and oh, <laughs> Jose has something to say about that. It, would that be something to look at for young men? I mean, you have no sort of threshold saying, now you are a man. In La Placita, we have something that's called La Cultura Cura, uh, Culture Heals. So uh, that's different for, uh, a little bit different for Edsel than it is for me. Uh, for Edsel, it was when he, he went to NACA and he started learning how to speak his language. For me, when I started uh, working for La Placita, it was a lot about speaking my language again. It was about speaking Spanish in public, about being able to say who I am, learning um, who my ancestors were from the uh, Purépecha gente, la gente de Purépecha that's from Michoacán. Um, learning a lot, what it meant to uh, be a boy going to become a man, what, what a, what uh, rites of passage that means, how uh, society, how we um, as young men have uh, over time created that uh, for each other. Um, we started to learn about how the traditional ways have been contaminated and been used by gang um, traditions. So a lot of symbols that uh, relate to us in, in tradition Gangs mm. use them now. Stuff oh, like that. wow! So I was just going to say yeah. that. Yeah. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Go. Ahead. Um, just that, I think that we've lost the traditional uh, rites of passage, but there are cultural rites of passage, and one of them was like you were saying, like the gang, like being introduced into a gang, or I think for young men, sex is a big thing. Like that kind of to them is a mm. rite oh, of now passage. I'm a man. Yes. Okay. Um, violence is a big thing mm -hmm. that men, young men see as a rite of passage. Um, it's like that. Uh, you fear me, so you respect me, kind of idea. So how do you so find more man. positive kind of rites of passage? That's the key. I think one of the biggest things that I do, and I know a lot of these men do here, is mentoring men that are around, that men that are in our community doing positive things. That that that, that needs to be seen more, right? Definitely. So like encouraging more men to like, well, recognize that their leaders well, are well, mentors. Like, rites of passage in general. I mean, <clears throat> I mean, in American society, it's you turn 18, you vote. You get a driver, or you get a driver license, or something like that. Um, but in native societies or traditional societies, you know, there's another element that whatever we do in our philosophies, there has to be grounded in spiritualness. So there is a spiritual That's rite of passage, similar to having faith in what we do in our normal, you know, normal, normal lives. Um, so in many native cultures, particularly for men, sweating is that sort of. Um, sense of spiritual rite of passage. You learn songs, you sweat with your elders, you sweat with your family members, and also, you, and in some cases, you sweat with women. So women, you know, are in that same spiritual setting with you. And so it, it, in that sense of space, that spiritual space, you know, you, you get those, in, those un, intangibles ready for you to, to, you know, to conquer the world. Because you have to have that inner peace and that inner confidence to to go into, you know, be a, a, a fully developed man. Well, and in terms of like fostering you, asked, you, you asked a really good question just yeah. a little bit ago, and I think it's mm -hmm. a, a good for us to answer. Okay. So earlier, when you were asking people if they were leaders or if they were role models, there was a lot of hesitancy. And in our communities, and I think this is some, one of the things that we share as men of color, is that we are, we are basically put in situations, right, where we're told that we are not leaders. For young men of color, I want to make sure that we know that Oftentimes, they're being told that they're not an adult, but when it comes to the criminal justice system, yes. they will get treated like, like they're expected to be an adult. Well, I wanted to ask Nam because you're, you're rather young. Traditional societies, elders are supposed right. to be the leaders. And so not necessarily a space for young people to be leaders. So how do you negotiate that and honor that tradition, but also step into leadership and encourage young men to do that? There's a hierarchy in the community where elders are held at very high esteem. Um, but at the same time, like a lot of these gentlemen here have spoken and they've said that they were lacking those elders in their lives, right? So in a sense, they were the role model of teaching you what you didn't want to be and what you didn't want to do. So when, you, when you're when you young and you're in those spaces, uh, I think you need to have a voice. You need to give men the space to talk about their identities. Because uh, I think uh, if a lot of people seem to forget that uh, most men of color, whether it be Asian, uh, Native American, Latino, a lot of people come here with a lot of historical trauma. 
we wouldn't be in this country if it was for a lot of you know worldwide colonization things that have happened um, and people seem to forget that that's where the identity is missing for them they not, I'm not exactly Asian I'm not exactly American where do I fall in between the spectrum uh, do I have a, a rite of passage in my Asian culture I have a rite of passage in American culture so I'm kind of just floating in this space in between right so that's why I think that storytelling and like Chris says like building circles is super super important um, because it gives men a space where they can solidify their identities. And uh, another thing that I, I've, I've seen that men don't recognize is we have tons of privileges. We have a lot of privileges. Like even now, we're talking about how we had lack, a lack of men in our lives, yet now, in this circle now, we're looking for more men to be leaders instead of looking at the people that held us, that, that held us down when we didn't have men in our lives, such as the women in our lives, right? So I know in Native, Native American cultures, in this spirituality, you're, you're taught that you you made up some male part, some female parts. So I think it's important that we uh, instead of always searching and saying that men need to have men in their lives to lead them, that we look around and look at the women that, le that have led us and give them the space and the credit they deserve. I wanted to say, like, I feel like that a, a lot of what we're talking about is we don't address the root causes of all these problems. And what he just said echoes with me. Like, I'm American, but I'm Mexican. I'm also gay, and I, I'm like, where at, who am I? And then when I see images on TV and in school, it's not me. It's a white male. And like you said earlier, I mean, women are still not paid equal. What does that send the message of when, when a man like Donald Trump can potentially be the leader of our nation and put my community like down, degrade Mexicanos, immigrants, and, and then there's all these people striving and screaming, yay, for Donald Trump. You know, what message does that send to someone like me or to all of us? People like to say with the Black Lives Matter movement, oh, slavery was so long ago. I'm like, how, how can, in, in the world can you not understand that what happened at that time, a long time ago, is still very much alive in our country today? How can you not say that not paying a woman the same wage doesn't affect what's going on? Indigenous people, this, we're in their land right now. How do, the historical trauma, what, how does that affect us? People, we don't address that. So how do you, if you're, talking with, to, to convince people that black lives matter, that young men of color matter, that their, their success is community success, the wider success. How do you communicate that to people? Well, for instance, like the organization, like the forum, like they provide opportunity to, to, to learn about civic identity and learn where we fit in and we, we do it together. Like I just wanna hit real quick, like he just inspired me to call my dad because my dad's in Mexico. So he doesn't even know he's leading me and he's leading me. But back to like how the forum provides opportunity. So finding leadership with each other. Exa oh, definitely. Because yeah. okay. once you're neuro interpersonal neurobiology, Daniel Siegel proves that like at 14, we start learning only, f we start looking more towards our peers than we do our adults. And that's just science. That's just nature. It's not what I want to do. It's what I naturally do. But like there's Oya, like we throw Oya, the forum does Oya Youth, uh, Youth Alliance. And we have 350 people coming, youth, 350 youth coming and talking about all these issues, about gender issues, about racial issues, about economic issues. So making the floor and making sure that we're supporting these organizations that are opening the floor. It sounds like we need, you know, to make a space for those voices, Rodney, but also people need to step up and recognize their own leadership. It can't just be you and Kevin <laughs> <It's> <laughs> and Larry and, you know. I think we all have to value diversity and that's not taught in, in, in the public school system. It's his story, if you know what I mean, his story. And we're not getting the true story. I'm not getting his story in the history books. I'm not getting his story. I'm not getting his story. I'm getting a mythical set of values, and it perpetuates throughout our society, and it's, it's faulty. And so we don't value each other because, based off of that history that we've been taught. We have to really reintegrate um, everybody's history because everybody, all these faces in here have, have a dynamic makeup of, of the American culture but it has to be put back into our psyches, into our, our society. And we have to put the spirituality component back into it as well. So does that mean people who look more like you moving into those places of power and changing those institutions? Uh, creating new in institutions? Uh, I think we are in those positions of power because he just did it and he didn't even know. But at the same time, not always. Yes, we are in positions of power, but if we're not literally transforming what that power looks like, Right, and Albuquerque is an incredible So how model. do we do that? Vote. <laughs> <laughs> you were going to say something? No, I, I was just going to kind of piggyback on what Nam was saying, is that one of the things that I think we don't do is, uh, 
you know, for me, being in gender violence um, and many people here, um, we're part of a movement that wasn't started by us. So yes. we can't just learn from men, right? There are women that have wealth of experience and knowledge in this field, and we are a tool to continue that movement too. And so I think that, um, yes, we need to learn from our men, but there are a lot of people we can learn from. I just wanted to say that, just just saying, like, uh, I think one way to transform that power is to say, like, I think uh, what you all are doing, how farming is cool, and letting people know that on, like, a small level, not only voting on a big level and putting your number out there on, on a national level, but on a small dyad just between two people saying, you know what, what you're doing is awesome, it's so cool, yeah. and it wants me to, makes me want to do it. Well, I and it, another, I'm sorry, the, the other example I wanted to put out is the Barrio Youth Corps, right, funded by Robert Wood Johnson, a small grant. And if I think about, like, how, now this program is going to end in October, what happens to these young men after October when their funding runs out at La Placita? Like, for me, I want to say, let's, that's easy for me. Shift the $100,000 we want to spend to put homie in juvenile detention, and now you have a program. How many, how many members are in the Barrio Youth Corps? Um, we have eight. Eight? We could, we could be employing eight young, young men to, like, be doing good work in their community, to, awesome be, to be making circles with each other. I, I don't know. It makes common sense for me to say that's where I'd rather have money invested in my, in my community rather than in locking somebody up behind bars. Well, Sorry to interrupt you, Kevin. Well, it's okay. I, I want to just extend your idea and think about, and we are, we, one thing we are talking about is the community. We're talking about community, we're talking about collaboration, we're talking about integration. And, you know, I, want, I would like to see, you know, a citywide initiative of men of color, you know, not just, just. How would in, that happen? Well, I mean, it has to come from, from with us, you know, like we are people, we are positions of power. We do have positions of influence, but also like bringing the Men of Color Initiative from UNM and extend it to a citywide initiative where we have a, gr a grand citywide mentorship program. We have a My Brother's Keeper challenge here in right. Albuquerque with the mm -hmm. mayor's office and APS. And one of the things that I would probably challenge all of us to do is, you know, why aren't the organizations or the young people here being involved with My Brother's Keeper Community Challenge here at the city of Albuquerque? And, and going back to what Naman and Larry reminded me of. When we raise up the voices, the issues of our little brothers, our young men of color, I want to also raise up the voices and issues of our young women of color. So, Eskagan, do you guys see yourselves as leaders? Yes. Well, <laughs> yes. well I, see. I, just, <laughs> I just want to say, like, uh, um, being called a leader is a humbling thing. It is. But within Native and, and traditional societies, the community elect the leaders. Mm -hmm. And for, in order for myself to be called a leader, I want my elders to, and my peers to call me a leader, not being appointed a leader. I just want to be a knowledge holder and trying to give that knowledge back to who needs it. That's why I started my consulting business, is I want to just give that knowledge to whoever wants it. What are you going to say, Hobie? Yeah, I wanted to share. I was just recently in a circle with some awesome leaders here in New Mexico that are both men, women, and trans community and queer people and we were we're all degreed we're all badass leaders and the the thing that really it it's very internal in me and it shocked me that it was in everyone else is that we still doubt ourselves as people of color not being white being queer or not conforming and not being cocky about it but we come from these very humble experiences yeah but we are leaders well i think I, i'm going to give our young men the last word how can our community and officials help you realize everything you can be? We're taught like we don't speak above our elders. We don't like you know we don't we don't do that. It's just there. We listen to them. We listen. We learn from them. So like for us to finally be in a position like to lead, it's kind of like like well, it's it's my time already. Like because <laughs> for them they have to they waited so long already. Like our leaders are like in their sixties or seventies and like. You're considered a young leader if you're in your 40s or 50s. That's still young to be a leader in our, in our community. So it's like when you're like my age and you, they want you to do something, and it's just like, well, it's like kind of like it's not my time yet, or I don't think it's I'm not there yet, like you know, mentally or whatever. But it's just. Do you need validation? Different. Kind do you need of. To tell us like, it's okay. Yeah, like from like I need. To, uh, I don't know, you know how to say it. Approval, <laughs> <laughs> like approval. Yeah, uh, like approval. Like people need to like like you said like I want I want to be like. I want my peers to tell me I'm a leader. I want someone else to tell me that other than like being the point like, hey, you're... You're a leader, Retzel. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, yeah. Another thing that community can do, you know, is uh, keep bringing young people together, you know. It's like, you know, 
tell them that we're here in this fight together, that we all have to go against the sisters and tell, and tell them that we're here not to steal from them, not to hurt from them, but we're here to just do our work so we could help from them, you know, so we could get all help each other. Or who to, Jose? Jose? <laughs> Me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, like <coughs> keeping us together, like in the community, like all oh, everybody, like showing us what's wrong and what's like what's good, like teaching us, you know, how to be a leader, how to be someone, like keeping us busy, like at the farm, like w when we're at the farm, we're like busy, like there's, they're keeping us there, you know, like that's what we should do, like the community, that's what they should do, like. There's other kids out there, you know, doing drugs, doing stealing, doing that. Like, bring them together and have them there, like, busy. Keeping their mind and hands busy. Yes. <coughs> I think uh, a lot about what this man said. So if you're able to afford millions upon millions of dollars a year to keep a young adult, you know, in the prison, in the prison for the rest of their freaking lives, you should be able to afford, uh, you know, good education for them. You should be able to afford... Um, a good uh, salary for women uh, to be great teachers for us and uh, men of color. You should be able to afford so many more things that you that uh, you say, oh, there's no more money for. Yes, there is. Obviously, there is because you're wasting so much money on other things. I can't say it any better than that. Mm -hmm. I want to thank you all for coming and joining us in this discussion. And thank you so much. Feel free to stay around and talk. Thank you.